Welcome to episode 148 of We Don't Die Radio. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. I want to invite you to meet me in person. I'll be one of the speakers at the Afterlife Research and Education Symposium, which is being held in Scottsdale, Arizona, this September 15th through 17th. There are over two dozen of the top afterlife researchers who are going to speak there, along with myself. And if you can't attend, I understand, but I want to still encourage you to check out the website, which is afterlifestudies.org. Some of these speakers have some amazing stories and are also up to some incredible things. There's a whole new world that even I don't know about, about connecting with those in the afterlife. So it's pretty darn exciting. Now onto our show and a fascinating one, I promise. We have a great lady coming to us from Orlando, Florida. Her name is Isabel Shofton Saavedra, and she has studied physics, mathematics, quantum mechanics, and metaphysics. Isabel is an international scientific medium whose private readings are strictly offered as a scientific double-blind sessions, and that means she does not know any information about you, the client, except for the relationship you may have with the subject of the reading. She is the co-founder of Coherence, Tools for Transformation. She is also the author of three books, God Consciousness, The Journey of a Science-Driven Psychic Medium, Spiritual Sight, The Manual, which she co-authored with Dr. Melvin Morse, and I Am, Therefore, I Think. Isabel teaches a remote viewing technique called Spiritual Sight, a tool for transformation, and is also an extremely talented singer, songwriter, entertainer who goes by the name Zaza. Her website is www.survivalofconsciousness.com. Isabel Shofton Saavedra, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be on your show. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you. And where are you, where are you from originally, Elizabeth? Uh, Isabel, sorry about that. That's right. I was born in France. Um, I, first, I want to apologize for my voice uh, for a singer. That's, that's pretty funny. But I have a cold, so I may sound a little funny, and I might cough here and there. So I just want to say that first. And um, so, yes, I was born in France. I'm not going to say many years ago, but a good few years ago. <laughs> and I spent uh, about 26 years of my life in France. Mm-hmm. And that's where I did uh, the bulk of uh, my studies uh, as far as ac- academics. And um, and I started working uh, in France in, in the world of event planning. Um, and then things, of course, uh, took a, a different turn. So uh, being French, I... Uh, I brought a little different um, culture, cultural, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, <clears throat> I have to cough. It's okay, it's okay. <clears throat> so yes, being from France, um, I have a different cultural aspect on things uh, and on life and, and also the matter of life after death. Um, and um, on, my, on my course to becoming who I am today, I used bo- both my cultural uh, similarities and differences to uh, integrate some um, some ideas about life after death. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to hear your story because when I was on your website this morning, first of all, I had your songs playing in the background as I was reading your website. And it was awesome. You have a beautiful, beautiful voice. L- love it. And I don't mind the cough. I've, I've done plenty of these episodes <laughs> that I've had a cold. So it just is what it is. And I'm glad we can spend this time together. But could you tell us, how did you, maybe even as a little girl, did, was there something that opened you up to science and spirituality? Where did your journey begin? Well, it began when I was a little girl, and uh, my dad was a, uh, a scientist. He uh, was um, an engineer. He studied uh, physics and mathematics with Professor De Broglie in France, who is the brother of the the famous De Broglie, who is the father of the quantum mechanics uh, theory. Wow. And so he... Um, he he was passionate about science and physics and um 
so he would always take me outside at night and we, we would look at the sky and we have a beautiful sky. I'm, I'm from Normandy and back then there was n no pollution. Uh, so the sky was beautiful, especially during winter. And he would teach me the constellations and, and a little bit about, you know, stars and planets and galaxies. And I got fascinated by that. Sure. Fascinated because it, I was looking at the sky and, and, and I was wondering what's out there and how big is the universe and where do we come from? And so all these questions came to my mind very early on. And I was asking my dad lots of questions mm -hmm. and uh, he didn't have all the answers. And um, I was asking my mom some questions. My mom is not a scientist, um, but she's very, very attuned with uh, people. She's a very compassionate person. She is very empathic. And so I was also asking her these questions and she's, she is, um, she was raised Catholic. So she tried to give me some answers, uh, within the religious realm. And those answers were not really, um, didn't really fit uh, what I was looking for. Right. So I was left with a scientific approach and a spiritual approach, but neither one of them were actually giving me the full answers that I were looking for. Mm -hmm. So very early on, I started to be fascinated by the big questions. Um, where are we coming from? Mm -hmm. When did the universe start? Um, do we die? And if we die, I mean, we do die, but we don't die. We right. know that. But back then, you know, um, at age 10, my first grandfather uh, passed away and I was shielded by my family from the funeral, from everything. And it triggered even more questions. Sure. Where are we going when we die? Is this really the end? Because according to my dad, when we die, we're done. Mm -hmm. Very, my dad was a very, very conservative scientist. Um, and my mom was like, no, you know, we, when we die, we go to heaven. And I'm like, where is heaven? What is this? So many questions, many questions. And I didn't find, I didn't have the answers. Neither one of them were able to give me the, the answers that I were really looking for. Right. So, um, so what I did was I, as I grew up, I started to ask around and, um, I became fascinated by metaphysics. So I started to, you know, a lot of kids do the widget board and that kind of things when yes. they grow up. And I got into that, but I got into that really like I was extremely, extremely fascinated by it. And one day I was about 12. I told my dad, look, you know, um, I understand that what's around us might not be um, might not be anything paranormal. But if it's anything normal, then we should be able to, as uh, in, by, with science, we should be able to really document that. And mm -hmm. I want to do a table tipping session with you since you're a scientist. Would you do it with me? And um, surprisingly, my dad said, okay, you know what? I've had enough since, you know, you, you're insisting, you're obsessed by that. I'll do it with you. Nothing will happen, but I'll do it with you. And at least I will prove to you that Nothing will happen. Isabel, you have to explain what a table tipping session is as your explanation, because we haven't talked right, about this right. too much. Some people it might not be familiar. You are sitting around a table, preferably a wooden table. Don't ask me why, but that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And you place your hand above the table without touching it. And you're try, you try by the power of your mind to make the table move. Okay. Sounds crazy. Uh, sounds crazy, right? Right. So, and I told my dad, you know, I want to do this. And he said, okay, I'll do it with you under one condition. I don't believe in this spirit mumbo jumbo thing. So I believe in science. So I believe that there might be some forces that we are not aware of. And, that, and, and I believe that there might be some, some power of our mind that we are not aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we do that, this is the way I want to do it. I want to do it like through our mind we're going to think the tower the the tower i'm sorry the table is going to move mm -hmm. but we're not going to call any spirits or anything because i don't believe in this and i don't want this i said fine i'm fine with that i was 12 i was like okay as long as we do it i'm fine mm -hmm. and so we sat around the table we invited my sister who's 12 years older than me she's a veterinarian so she's also into science and um 
and she was already a vet back then. So we, the three of us, we sat uh, actually at my uncle's house because they have a big round, nice table. And we sat for about um, 10 minutes and nothing happened. We, you know, I was, I was so excited. I could, I could feel the energy throwing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. going through me. And, and I remember having tears coming out of my eyes. This was, that, that was the, the power of the experience. Mm -hmm. And so. after maybe 15, 20 minutes of nothing happening, my dad said, okay, I think we're done. I think I've proved to you that nothing's happening. And I said, dad, dad, I can feel it. Can we just do it like five, 10 more minutes? And he goes, okay, but that's it. What a good dad. Yeah. <laughs> and so we went back to it. And maybe a couple minutes later, we heard a crack. And we all looked at each other and the crack was coming from the table. And my dad said, well, you know, it's wood. So wood cracks. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing, you know, uh, nothing not normal into that. And literally 10 seconds after he said that, we went back to it and the table, and I have no other word for it, the table lifted itself and literally crashed towards my dad. My dad just had time to do this, I mean, and, and uh, trying to uh, avoid the table. And the table fell on the floor. Actually, one of the, one of the feet of the table broke. Oh, my gosh. The floor and my dad and my sister and I we were like and it made so much noise all our family was in the kitchen everybody else was in the kitchen we had instructed them do not bother us until we're done and it made so much noise that everybody came out of the kitchen running asking what happened what happened and uh, they saw the table on the floor and to this day well my dad passed away in September last September but to the day he died, he had no explanation for it. And he said, I don't have any explanation. I have no explanation. I can't tell you what happened. I know I didn't touch it. I know you didn't touch it. I know your sister didn't touch it. I have no idea what happened. So that was a pretty intense experience. And I was 12. And um, from that moment, I just didn't stop. Of I course. Stop. You want to know what else? What's possible? Oh, wow. So it was it was fascinating. So as I grew up, I really became uh, interested in the idea that there are indeed probably either forces or ways we can work with our mind mm -hmm. that we don't know how to use in our everyday life. And uh, if we train ourselves to tap into these type of either information or forces, I didn't know. Uh, it took me years to understand and to think that and to come to today where I think I have a pretty good idea of what it is that we can tap into that and indeed um, realize uh, that we have much more power in us than we think we do. Yes. So, um, so um, when I was about fast forward about um, eight years I'm now in Paris. I'm from a small town in Normandy, but I moved to Paris to uh, study for college. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, college is tough. And I was going through actually um, my dad being a scientist, and I wanted to be. I by, back then I had decided I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Wow! So I went to college to study math and physics in an in a very intensive um, college type of college that. Um, I don't know if we have that here in the U.S., but it, it's called uh, cram school. Basically, you go to college and you learn in one year what you usually learn in the university in two years. Wow. That's so hard work. Literally cram math and physics in your mind until you can't take it anymore. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> so I started with that. And um, unfortunately, this was a little bit too intense for me. And my, my brain was not uh, made for that. Mm -hmm. So the cram school didn't work, but I did learn a lot uh, in terms of more math and more physics. And, I, and, it, and it kept really uh, giving me the, the will to, to know more, but in a more philosophical way, in a more um, open way. Because I realized that science 
as much as science is indispensable and it is a very important tool in our human life, uh, science does not answer all the questions. No. It does not. So, um, and I and I had the perfect example when I, you know, when my grandfather died and my dad couldn't give me the answers. All the answer he had was, well, we die and that's it. But I said, you know, we die, that's it. Uh, it doesn't really, I, I, I don't feel it that way. Mm-hmm. So when I was in, in, in college, uh, my second my, my second grandfather died, and um, it was very tough because I was very close to him. And um, he was a violin player. He was uh, into music. He uh, he taught me how to play the piano. And nice. and I remember uh, being with my parents. And when we received a phone call from the hospital, my parents told me to go to my, to my grandma and keep her company while they were going to the hospital. <clears throat> and so I went there and after saying maybe an hour with my grandma, she said, you know, she was going to retire to her bedroom because she was tired. And I was instructed to stay with her. So I stayed with her downstairs. It was the living room where my uh, grandfather used to play his violin and, and practice. And I laid down there on a the sofa and I kind of drifted, you know, when you drift in that state of consciousness where you're not asleep, but you're like on the edge of being very um, attuned with everything around you. Yes. Again, at that moment, I didn't know what all this meant. But now I know this is what happened. Um, And I turned my head and all of a sudden I saw my grandfather. He was right there. I saw his head, and and his head was right above his uh, his uh, music stand where he used to have his partitions, his music partitions. And at the time, stupid me, I completely freaked out. Uh, I was eight, I was eighteen or twenty, I don't remember. Uh, and instead of embracing the experience and saying, "Oh, you know, Pape," that was the way I called him, I ran out. <laughs> I can I can understand. You know, it's one thing to believe in this, but all of a sudden to see his face there. I ran scary. out. And would, sure. would that be today? I'd be like, I would be striking a conversation with my grandfather. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I ran out and uh, never told my parent. Never told my parents what happened. But I knew at that moment that I knew that there was definitely more than just death. Yes. This was just way way too powerful and way too real more real than reality, really, that I, I, I couldn't dismiss that. And so I went on and I uh, studied uh, in college. And from that moment, I started to have experiences. Uh, I was living by myself in Paris. and uh, and But those experiences that I had were not good ones in terms of, um, of what was happening. Um, the two main experiences that I had many little ones, but the two big ones that really, um, uh, were very powerful to me was when I was, were, uh, was after college. Now we're after college and I, I started to work in this event planning, uh, company and I was having lunch with my colleagues and we were just chit chatting after lunch, um, in the little hallway of the uh, office building, you have to understand that in Paris, all the office buildings are like five story high Mm -hmm. and there's a little courtyard in the middle. So all buildings, everything is built from the Haussmann era in the 17th, 18th century. So 19th century, sorry. So that's how all the buildings are built. So when you're in a little hallway, you have a window, you can see what's happening in the courtyard. You can see what's happening in the buildings, um, that are on the other side of the courtyard. And I was talking to my friend and all of a sudden I see on the, on one of the windows in the fifth floor on the building on the other side, a gentleman wearing a uh, business attire, slacks and a white shirt, just walking by the window. That's all he did. He walked by the window and inside his own office mm-hmm. and I stopped talking. I remember it was so powerful. I stopped talking to my friends and I turned around, all windows were closed. So, and I, with a voice, like I'm talking now, like I'm not screaming or anything. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was, I was talking to him and I said, why do you want to jump? And my colleagues looked at me and said, what, what did you say? 
I said, I don't know. I feel like this man wants to jump. And they're like, oh, you're crazy. And they looked and he was not even in the window anymore. And, but it was so powerful. I, I, I was very, very distraught by that feeling that I just had. So we, we finished our conversation and then we, we went back to work. And around 4 p.m., I will remember that for the rest of my life, around 4 p.m. that day, it was a Friday afternoon in September, I heard the biggest, weirdest, loudest noise I could ever think about. And instantly, everybody in the office was like, what was that? And instantly I knew. And I said to them, he jumped. And unfortunately, yeah, I was right. He did. Ooh. And I felt so, so distraught, so... I was I was just a wreck. Um, I remember my manager dismissed me for the day. She said, "You go home and because I I I just couldn't take it because I knew and I was like I knew I knew he was gonna jump. And from that moment, I was like, man, if I know it and I can't do anything, what's the point of knowing it? Right. And that's when everything really started to spin into. Um, either I had two choices, either I just decided I don't want this anymore. I don't want to feel that, or I want to know more and I want to, and I want to do it until I know all of it so I can help. Sure. So I do something. And of course I chose the second solution. Yes. (laughs) And, uh, from that point on, I just bought every single book on the planet about everything that had anything to do with intuition. Um, psychic mediumship, um, 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 quantum mechanics, physics, because I thought maybe I could find answers there too. Yes. Uh, self-help books. I mean, you all the books that could be touching the subject of spirituality, science related to consciousness. Yes. Um, I, I bought them and I, I I'm not going to say I read them all because there are still many, many books, but I did a lot of reading. And while I did a lot of reading, I started practicing. And I figured, you know, if this comes to me unwillingly, maybe I can work it so that it comes to me willingly. Mm -hmm. And little by little, I realized that our brain has the capability of doing a lot of things that we are not aware of. And it's not a gift. I, I really am very... I'm always very amazed when people say, oh, I have this gift. I'm like, I'm sorry, this is not a gift because it's a cap. It's a brain capability that we all have. We all are born with it. Now, the analogy that I always do is we all learn with the capability of, of playing the piano, right? We can all learn how to play the piano. Now, not everyone is going to become a Mozart, right? Right. But we can all learn how to do it. And I think with intuition, it is exactly the same. Uh, you want to call it intuition, the sixth sense. I actually believe we are more than we have more than six sense. I, I believe we have up to eight sense, and the ninth sense being the the globality of everything. To me, we have a sixth sense, and then we have a seventh sense, which is the sense of knowing. When you say, "I just knew it," see, I knew it. Mm-hmm. That's another. That's another type of of perception. Uh, and then this feeling of being connected with everyone, that's, again, another sense. Um, and we all have this capability of, of working with that and working our brain like a muscle. Of course, I know it's not a muscle, but working our brain to um, create maybe n- new neural pathways that will help us next time we want to willingly make the connection get connected easier and faster. Mm -hmm. You know, when we learn how to ride a bicycle, it takes, it takes critical thinking first because we have to learn how to place our feet on the pedals and then to learn how we have to learn how to hold the handles Mm -hmm. to balance ourselves. So our left brain, which is uh, as a neuroscience metaphor, the location where the analysis of everything, the, the, the 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 critical thinking is happening. This is what's happening in our left brain. We are trying to figure out how this bicycle thing works. Right. 
And when we do that, our right brain doesn't have much to do with it because, you know, the center of emotions, maybe other than being a little scared of, of riding the bicycle, but it's not going to help us actually um, learn how to ride a bicycle. Um, so when we ride a bicycle, we create neural pathways in our, in our brain with, and we create new connections. Mm -hmm. Once these connections are established, we don't forget. We don't have to, each time we get on the bike, to relearn how to ride a bike. We know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Just like driving a car. Absolutely. We don't think about it. We you just do it. it. Mm -hmm. You do it. So what happens is I believe we can train a brain to, to get connected in a different way with our uh, surroundings and with a certain extent to our universe by creating new connections in our brain using both left and right brain. And, and I'm going to, what, what I, to me is very interesting is that <clears throat> I, I make the, uh, the parallel between quantum mechanics often and, and, and intuition and, uh, and the power of spirituality, which I know it sounds crazy. I love it. It doesn't sound crazy to me. But, but the reason why I do that is because I see so many similarities mm -hmm. between the two. Um, for example, uh, in quantum mechanics, there is this principle, which, called, which is called the principle of um, indeterminism. What it is, is that in the quantum world, the very little world of things, uh, subatomic particles, smaller than atoms, everything obeys uh, certain, a certain set of laws, the laws of quantum mechanics, which are completely different uh, of the laws that we know we understand our, at our level. Like at our level, we have gravity. We know that if we jump out of, you know, out of a cliff, we're mm -hmm. going to fall oh. down and die. That's pretty simple, you know. Uh, well, it, apparently in quantum mechanics, things don't work that way. And one of the principles that are very interesting to me is the, this principle of uncertainty in determinism, which means that if you are, for example, um, if you are a particle and you're running fast um, and we try to measure you, we can measure your speed, but we can't measure your location. So it's kind of strange because that means that if, I, if I'm focusing on the way you, on the, the speed of your running, I can't tell anymore where you are. But if I tell where you are, uh, if I focus on where you are, then I can't tell how fast you're going. And that is pretty, it's a pretty incredible thing when you think about it, because we don't have this problem here. If I see a car running, if I have all the, all the parameters, yes. I can, I can tell how fast the car goes, where it is, not, not in the small word of quantum mechanics. And I'll give you the analogy of the play, of the piano playing now, and mm -hmm. you'll understand where I'm going with that. Okay. If you play, if you learn a piece, if you learn how to play a piece on the piano, first you're going to have to learn and to focus on the technique of the piece to put your fingers in the right place so that you can actually play the piece. Right. When you do that, you can't focus on the emotions of the piece. It's impossible. You can't not learn how to put your fingers on the keyboard and learn how to play the piece so remember where and when and the sequence mm -hmm. and bring the emotions at the same time. Impossible. And so when you focus on the technique, you learn the ability of feeling the piece. And if you try to feel the piece first, you'll never learn how to play it. Right. So it's very similar to what happens in quantum mechanics. But there is a way where... Um, you can actually try to have a, a view that will help you see everything at once. And we call that a bird's eye view in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And in, in the work that I do, I call that spiritual sight. I like it. What is spiritual sight? Well, spiritual sight is a technique that uh, takes its roots from two different opposite uh, and yet very complementary um, um, trends. One is modern science, 
with the work of neuroscientists, physicists, and actually a psychic medium. The technique was actually uh, started in the 70s, and it bared the name of controlled remote viewing. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually a technique that was commissioned by the DIA and the CIA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it worked so poorly that they commissioned it for 25 years. Yes. If you see what I mean. Yes. So it was a, it was a big success. Um, for 25 years, the government used the technique to try to figure out what was going on with the Soviet Union because they were interested in that mainly. And the whole thing was about military and, and spying, but they were using mine training technique to remote view sites in the Soviet Union, meaning blindly figure out what's going on there. So the technique that I use is a part of that, but it's blended with ancient um, Buddhist, Buddhist wisdom and, and, and philosophy. And the reason we do that is that because the technique that was, that was put together in the 70s had absolutely no wish or no will to better humanity. And that, to me, doesn't work. Whereas Buddhism has the only, uh, the only purpose of the, the Buddhism philosophy is to better humanity, mm -hmm. to be more compassionate, to be more empathic. And I believe that if you, if you actually are more empathic, more compassionate, it actually even opens you even more to gathering information that you would not be able to gather otherwise. Right. So when you mix, when you mix the two techniques or the two philosophy or the two um, scientific protocol and philosophical protocols, you come up with a technique of mind training, spiritual sight, that helps you gather more information because it's all about gathering more information. And the fact that our loved ones don't die, uh, it's actually um, information. And this is another thing that is very important in, in my work is that why am I so interested in science is because, well, when the universe was created, it all started with a little sing singular point called the singularity that it, you know, turned into uh, the Big Bang inflation and then turned into atoms coming together and stars and galaxies and planets until life came upon, life forms and sentient beings. And the very interesting part is that in science, we have answers for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We have answers for for all that caused the effects that we see every day. Everything in the universe uh, obey, obeys the law of cause and effect. Yes. Everything, everything, except that little singular point of the beginning, which we have no cause for it. And, but when we come to the creation of sentient beings, there is something more that came upon that, that didn't exist before. And we're not the only ones, obviously. There is, you know, one, 25, 25 probably sextillion planets in the whole universe. So chances are we're not alone. <laughs> right. Um, so when, when, when sentient beings came upon, something more came upon. And, and it's the fact that sentient beings also obey the law of cause and effect, but they also have their own. We have our own law of cause and effect called karma. And that's related to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we obey the law of the universe. We also obey the law that we created ourselves. And according to Buddhism and some, um, and somewhat what I believe in, I believe that sentient being consciousness, if you prefer, is really at the beginning of everything. We are missing that little cause at the beginning of the universe in science. We don't have it. Right. I believe I have it. And it's called consciousness. I do believe consciousness is at the origin of everything. And consciousness is information because whatever is in the universe, whatever was at the beginning of the universe and is still now with us, mm -hmm. it's all embedded in the fabric of the universe. What I'm saying now, even if it was not recorded, is already out there. It's information. 
right. it's a lot of ones and zeros and it's information. I am information, you are information. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why I believe we are information and I'm going to all tie it up with the fact that we don't die. Okay. Is that there are three kinds of death. Uh, one is the medical death. We all know it's when the the brain has stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. Body heart stops, stops, heart stops, yes. We're done. This is it. This is the medical death. Mm -hmm. But until you're declared dead, legally, you're still not dead to the government. So that then there is the legal death. Okay. So you can be medically dead, legally dead. However, there is a third death that we don't think about and it happens all the time. It's called the information theoretical death. And it's real. I mean, it's, it's out there. Uh, neuroscientists talk about it. Physicians uh, talk about it. Um, what is information theoretic death? It is what makes you. And what does make you? What does make you? It's who you are, the things you like, the things you've done, your memories, um, and, and all that makes you as a sentient being. Mm -hmm. You could be medically dead, you could be legally dead, and still not theoretically informational, inf information theoretically dead. Example, you could have somebody dying on the operating table, being legally declared dead in the next five minutes, mm -hmm. still having an NDE, and come back. You never lost your information theoretic you. Never. Okay. And so, for me, the information theoretical you is what is you, really. Consciousness, pure consciousness. Yes. And for me, pure consciousness never dies. It's part of the universe. It's part of who we are. And it's spaceless, timeless, which is why we can connect with people whenever, wherever. Um, and, and it goes on. And the work I do is I train my brain because I know our brain have the, has the capability of reaching out to this information mm -hmm. and tapping into it and bring it back. And I, I also even go further, and I talk about it in my uh, latest book, I Am Therefore I Think. I believe information is not passive. I believe information is actually active. We do part of the way, we go part of the way, and information also has the capability to come, of coming to us. That's, if scientists were listening to me, they would be like, that's completely metaphysical, there's, there's nothing. <laughs> this girl is crazy, <laughs> yes, don't listen it's to her. <laughs> it's true, it's true, but you know, there's a lot of uh, science that is also metaphysical. The fact that, you know, science... Um, uh, says that, that we have the singularity that turned into a big bang and into a universe and um, and we don't have any um, answer for that little singularity and we come up with all kinds of weird theories. That is pretty metaphysical to me. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of um, unanswered questions in science that um, to me are on the same level uh, of the questions that we are asking ourselves when we are trying to figure out what consciousness is and if we die or if we don't. And I think that science today has reached a point where it has and it has to work with and it needs philosophy and spirituality to continue working towards finding answers. Mm -hmm. I think we came to a point where there's no, no way today with the, the understanding of science that we have we will be able to find scientific answers because we can't replicate because you know about science, 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 you know, a scientific reasoning is that you have to replicate. You have to be able to replicate stuff and experience. If you can't replicate your experience, then you have no ground in any theory. Well, uh, there are a lot of theories that are out there that can't be replicated because there are just thought experiments. Uh, a lot of quantum mechanics is based on thought experiments. And it's pretty metaphysical to me, if you ask me. So I think we are on the same level today. And science doesn't have the right to say that what we do is, is not grounded. Because it's grounded. And uh, in a nutshell, that's what I think today. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Isabel, I just I want to bring up, you have a great quote on your website, the Jules Verne. 
I don't know if you have that handy. But oh, yes. After death communication is to reality what Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon was to science, a true story waiting to be proven. Absolutely. I love that because Jules Verne I, had that book forever ago and mankind made it a reality. Absolutely. And he made so many predictions, actually. Yeah. Uh, what Jules Verne wrote came true. Uh, so it was considered back then science fiction, metaphysics, uh, a crazy guy, you know, inventing stories. But he, I think, tapped into something that um, when you're a writer, you are in that state of mind when you write where you have to kind of put yourself in this little bubble. You know that you're a writer, you're an author. So when you start writing, it has to come, you know, something back then they will call it a muse, but it, it might not be just a muse. It might, might be that your brain is able to tap into things, oh, into sure. information that is readily out there, the present, the future, the past. It, to me, there's no time. No. So we can tap into a lot of different things, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is in the past, the present, or the future. And what does it tell? What does it tell us? And what and what does it give us? Well, it give it gives us tools, literally, because it, it's awesome to be able to communicate with our deceased loved ones. But that's not the only thing we can do with that. We can better ourselves. We can have a a, a richer, fuller. Uh, understanding of our reality and and we can sometimes uh, it helps to um, just solve problems in our daily lives mm -hmm. I mean literally not as I mean two days ago and that's an anecdote but it works too uh, somebody asked me to uh, do a spiritual site session to find an earring head for her mom she lost mm -hmm. an earring head so I don't know I don't have the results yet, yet. it would be interesting to know if <laughs> in a couple of days if she found it but we can apply uh, the the technique that we teach our brain to get more information, to be more attuned to our surroundings, to many different things. Uh, Dr. Morris uh, and I have been um, trying to uh, uh, use the technique, for example, to enhance um, diagnosis. As a doctor, he's he, he, he told me um, when way back then he was working in the, as a, as a one of those flying doctors, you know, that fly in remote places. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, when you're in an emergency situation and you, ha you have your knowledge, you know everything. You know, as a doctor, you know, you have the knowledge of your medical knowledge. But when you are into a life and death situation, these very important 10 seconds that you have to save your patient are not based on your medical knowledge anymore. It's uh, The medical knowledge is already there. When you you need now is your gut feeling of what's the best solution to and the best course of action to take to save your patient. Right. And that's not the knowledge that's coming from another, a different place. Mm -hmm. Sure. And call it the gut feeling, your hunch intuition. But he says, yeah. I want to be able to work that hunch as much as I worked my left brain to train the, as a doctor. And that's possible. That's very possible. I don't want to forget before this interview is over. Um, if you could share how this turned into your mediumship and maybe give us some examples of what you mean by double blind. And many of our listeners right now are looking for evidence that their loved one goes on. And maybe if you have a story or two of some of the connections that you've made through using sure, this. Yeah. And just to explain what, what it means to be double blind medium. Right. So as a medium, I don't do uh, my sessions uh, um, typically like uh, a lot of mediums do out there. I don't I don't sit in front of my clients. I don't do one on one. I don't do phone readings. I don't do one on one on Skype. Mm -hmm. I don't see my clients. I don't talk to my clients. The only thing I'm asking them when they request the reading via email is just a relationship. That's all I need. I want a relationship so I'm able to connect with the right person and I'm just not going astray and trying to connect with many other people. So right. if you want to connect with your daughter or with your mother, that's all I need. And I don't want to know anything else. And I don't want to, when I do the reading, uh, I usually do it within a 14 day period, a two week period, let's say from the moment the reading has been confirmed. 
So why is it double blind? Well, it is double blind because in science, when you create a double blind experiment, neither side of the experiment should know what the other side is doing so that it creates more um, authenticity and mm -hmm. more validation about the experience and the, the experiment. So the double blind part of my experiment is that I don't know anything about my client. I don't see them. I don't talk to them prior or during the reading. And my client doesn't know when I'm doing a reading within this two week period because I don't tell them. Great. They only know when I do the reading, when they receive the email, it could be two days after the ordering. It could be at the very end of the 14 days. It's whenever I feel like it, whenever mm -hmm. I sense that it is the right time to do it, but they don't know. So, all my readings are done this way. I don't do stage readings. I will never do it. I don't want to do it. So plus I believe there is a, a, a kind of a decency into when you share personal information, you might not want to share it with, you know, 500 more people. Right. People are fine with that and it's okay. But I know that there are people that prefer to have a uh, more, in, you know, intimate kind of environment. So mm -hmm. that it works perfect. I've had many great experiences uh, doing readings um, from um, connecting with with um, children. And that's very, uh, it's very, it's always very emotional. I have this lady who uh, came to me and wanted to connect with her son. And that's all I knew. And um, the first reading was a little difficult for her because she was not expecting an email. She didn't know what to do with it. And, but after she read it, she came back to me and she said, I want to know more. And so as I did more readings, um, I got to get to know this person and his son without having her telling me anything about it, about him. And I understood that he People thought that he might have committed suicide, and I told him, no, it's not a suicide. It's an accident. It's a freak accident. And when I told that to her, it was just a such a relief Absolutely. for her to understand that because she, her gut feeling was telling her that, but she didn't trust her gut feeling mm -hmm. because everybody else was thinking, you know, that might be what it is. And from that point on, we got a great relationship with uh, his son and he kept telling me, uh, uh, you know, different things. And, and um, the last reading I, I, I did for him. Um, and I think I quoted uh, what happened on my website. Uh, I just, I kept hearing um, the song of Michael Jackson, ABC one, two, three, ABC one, two, three, mm -hmm. I had, and uh, I told her, I have no idea why. Because that's also one important thing when when you get the information, the trying to interpret it is a big disaster because your frame of reference is completely different from the frame of reference of the person you're trying to connect with and of the person who's requesting the reading. We have two complete sets, uh, different sets of lives, of DNA, of, the w of, of ways of understanding things. So if I'm trying to interpret things, I will most likely get it wrong. It's a complete, it's, it's normal. Mm -hmm. so the important part is to get the information and deliver it raw. So I delivered it raw because if I had tried to interpret, okay, why is he trying to give me ABC one, two, three? Is there any meaning behind it? Right. And your mind is starting to think instead of feel. And then you go, you're done. This is wrong. So I just gave it to her. And they were in a hotel room when when she received the reading, and she said, "I read it late at night, felt pe peaceful, felt peaceful. Sorry, went to bed. Next morning, we left with my husband, and I was thinking of him and about the reading. And we got in the car and we turned the radio, and ABC one two three from Michael Jackson went on first song. <laughs> so I didn't need to interpret that because that's the meaning. He was just trying to tell you, hey, I'm here. You know exactly." And that's all, that's all, that's all we need. That's really all we need is to know they're here and they're okay. Um, another example that was uh, a pretty powerful one. I read a man who was in a coma um, four years ago now. His name was Dustin. 
And uh, I didn't know um, what happened was um, I was I was pinged on Facebook by a lady who was part of uh, this group of consciousness that I had and a friend of a friend. And she said, hey, I have this friend I would like you to read for. Um, and um, so I did the reading mm-hmm. at the way I usually do, uh, blind. Yeah. I sent her the um the reading and that night she answered me like whoa 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 um so long story short dustin was in a coma because he had a very aggressive form of um of of brain cancer Mm -hmm. um he had had an operation and um his family was very um distraught because he was not doing well and uh they were wondering if he could communicate. hear them or right. communicate. Well, because he was in the deepest coma of of possible on the scale. Okay. Um, so no communication, nothing. And so um, a few things that came th- that came uh, to me that day uh, were immediately validated by the friend because he she knew him, but she didn't know him as well as his sister, so she transferred the reading to Dustin's sister, who had been with him that day. And in the things that, uh, one of the things that he said was, I want my music. You guys are not giving me my music. I want my music. Play my music for me. And then the sister confirmed that that afternoon they were sitting with him and they were, as they were talking to him, they actually asked him, knowing that they would not get a physical answer but they actually asked him do you want us to give you your music and he gave me the answer so i transferred the answer and the answer went back to the sister so she got the answer the next day she brought the music um he gave me so many so much information about what he wanted i want this i want this to be changed uh there's this on my wall this is too bare the windows are on this side there's two door on the right side and this and that and then he gave me a, information about um actually the first thing he said was cat and i was like great <laughs> you know but <laughs> I, I'm, I have learned not trying to interpret that i just wrote cat yes and then dustin's sister transferred the reading to his wife to dustin's wife and she read it and it took her about a good week or so before she actually sent me her long, long email with all the validations. And she said, cat, first thing you said, we had a little cat and the kitten actually died in quite a horrible accident. We're not going to talk about that. So mm-hmm. they were all very distraught about the cat's death, the kitten death. And they they had told each other that if one day they you know one would die before the other that they would you know check the cat make sure the cat was okay, and that was the first thing that came to me the cat mm-hmm. that is fine. Uh, but the most important part for Dustin's wife when was when he he told me and I heard in my in my mind's voice Tuesday Friday Tuesday Friday Tuesday Friday and. Again, I learned not to interpret that because if I tried, that would probably be wrong. Mm-hmm. And I just wrote it down. I said, he keeps telling me Tuesday, Friday, Tuesday, Friday. I don't know why. Turns out because of the severity of uh, his case, he had to be transferred to a hospital that was further away from where his wife was living. And that, well, she, you know, she, she had to work she, and she, they had a big family he was a young father of six children he was only in his early 30 but 30s but he, they they both had six children together wow. so lots of work and so she was only able to go see him and drive make the drive on fridays and she would stay with him on until every tuesdays and then on tuesday she would leave again go home for two days and then come, come back, back the next friday so friday or friday tuesday and that was her pattern. That's when he, she was going to visit him every week. And he knew it. So that was for her the very important part of the reading. Among other validations, this was for her the most powerful because he knew that um, she was here with him. 
And when she was here with him, he also knew what his sister had asked him since he had given answers. So to them, it gave them a lot of comfort. Unfortunately, Dustin passed away about two months after the reading. Mm -hmm. It gave them a lot of comfort knowing that they could actually speak to him and he was there. And the coma didn't mean anything. The fact that his brain was non-functional didn't mean a thing. He was Dustin. He was there. He actually, his sense of humor was intact because he gave me a few points, which I don't remember exactly what it was about, but I think there was a point about, about fishing and another one about a truck and that his wife confirmed and as, as a, some kind of joke that they had and mm -hmm. he, he had his sense of humor intact. So you see the information theoretic him was there intact, intact. And I think that was to me a, one of the most powerful reading I've ever been given to do because I was not communicating with, with someone who was, who had passed away, but someone who was actually alive and unable to communicate, which to me was like, man, you know, so we have to, we have to be careful. We have to understand that uh, we don't know everything about science, neuroscience. There's still much more that we need to learn and that we are much more than a body with a brain. We are consciousness. And, and consciousness is who we are. And that's why I wrote, I am, therefore I think, because you don't need a brain to be who you are. You are first, and then you have a brain who helps you basically manifesting who you are. I am, therefore I think. Yeah. And this, this reading was to me the best proof that this is the case. And you this wrote a, you wrote a, uh, a song and have a music video. Right. That I, I I was so pictures. inspired and so um, this reading really, it was uh, a little overwhelming to me at the mm -hmm. beginning. Now it's, it's great. I embrace it. It was, I, I embraced it back then, but it was, it was overwhelming because after that um, we shared, you know, things. Once the reading was done, then we had an open conversation with uh, Dustin's wife and Dustin's friend. And, and, and I said, I have this song that is just coming to my mind and I want to write it. And, uh, and I asked, uh, just his wife, I said, would you be okay if I write a song? She said, yes, of course. And, um, she was kind enough. She's a wonderful photographer and she was kind enough to send me all kinds of pictures of him and, and, and their family. And, and I just, uh, teamed up with my, one of my best friends, uh, Danny Donati, who is a, uh, a film composer and award-winning film composer and he wrote the music and I wrote the lyrics and the song was done in three days and we brought in a great musician from the Philharmonic in Orlando and we just did that song. What's the name of the song? It's, uh, well, I, I have it in, uh, in English and in French, so uh, I have two versions. Uh, okay. The one in English is Can You Hear Me? Mm -hmm. and, and in French is uh, Montaudi Vous. Wow. Beautiful. And it's it's on iTunes and uh, but it's uh, but it's I mean you can listen to it for free on on YouTube. Um, it, it it's just um, I felt like I felt I had to put it down into words and into music because music and words are part of uh, you know what we use our, our senses. Uh, our senses are you know the five senses is the sounds the the. The images and, and all this together is with the sixth sense, the seventh sense, and the eighth sense. To me, all this together is is what I call coherence. Yes, yes. For our person listening to our conversation right now, just if you're listening on to this on um, YouTube, you can scroll beneath this episode, and I actually have a link to Isabel's website and also to her musician website where you can listen to this song. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if you go to we don't die radio dot com and click on episode one four eight, I have a picture of the beautiful Isabel and also links to her books and to her websites just to make it easy. Um, Isabel, we only have a few minutes left is there something I haven't asked you that I should or you want to share or even for me right now I am absolutely fascinated by this conversation which book of yours should I 
check out first? I mean, how, what, what do you think is the best way to get started to learn more? Because this is just the tip of the iceberg for me. And I've, I've done some remote viewing and studied with Russell Targ and done some many different things, but it's like, I, I want to, I'm thrilled that somebody's making this science, uh, spirituality connection. And I want to learn more. How would I get started in that? Well, um, of the three books that I, I mean, the two books that I wrote and the third books that I co-authored, mm -hmm. the first one is more as more an autobiographical kind of books, which also uh, intertwines with uh, very uh, layman uh, scientific concepts. So it's my story and little um, little nuggets of science in between. That's God consciousness. Uh, so the it was kind of, of a science-driven psychic God medium. Right. Okay. Right. So it is my journey from when I was a child. I mean, you, you heard the story you now on the radio to uh, pretty much uh, five, six years ago. And after that, there is uh, spiritual sight is really a manual. So spiritual sight is if you want to learn how to remote view, if you want to learn the technique, uh, the mind technique of, of remote viewing and spiritual sight. This book is a manual, so when you read it, you are going to learn how to do it. Uh, I usually sell this book when I have classes because I can give the class and have people refer to the book. Mm -hmm. But you can read the book and learn by yourself. There's no problem with that. Uh, the third one is a more advanced um, digging more into science type of book, the I Am Therefore I Think. Um, so the first seven, eight chapters are scientific concepts that I tried to bring into layman's term, but I felt like I needed to explain what, um, what the quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics principles are. There are seven of them. I felt like I needed to explain what certain concept of cosmology about the, uh, you, the origin of the universe are about. So that I could bring the science, the spirituality, and the intuition after that, and tie the two together, so people can understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it might be a little uh, uh, scientific at the beginning, even though it's really in terms uh, that everyone can understand. But then, after chapter eight, I talk really about why I needed to uh, bring this and I ask all the questions um, all the questions that we are all interested in you know um, um, is consciousness um, something that just comes with uh, within uh, a fetus in the utero and then dies mm -hmm. or is it something that goes on is it something that is static is it something that we can interact with uh, what came first the egg or the chicken, mm -hmm. consciousness or the brain. Uh, so I have a discussion like that uh, towards from the chapter eight, nine towards the end, chapter seventeen, I believe. So pretty, pretty much half of the book is um, is, is is getting uh, the reader familiar with all those uh, weird concepts of quantum mechanics that are actually pretty exciting and fun to me. <laughs> yes, uh, the fact that you can be at two different in two different places at the same time is kind of uh, cool. Um, uh, the fact that you um, you can uh, go through a wall and part of you is, is still on the side of the wall, but the other part of you is on the other side of the wall and it's all okay, you know. And uh, so when you think of all these principles and you are and you try to tie them with with the uh, with what we think consciousness is and can do, it all works together. It all works. I don't have an equation to show that it is the way it works. But I have experience and experiments every day when I do my readings that show that there is a tie. I'm sure of that. And so the third book is more uh, is more into that kind of a, a direction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited, Isabel. I know for myself after taking a, a course on remote viewing and just really, like I said, the tip of the iceberg. But if I could see what's in a photograph that is in an envelope or if I could tell what's on a friend's dining room table 2,000 miles away it, it, it opens the door to we are much more than just this body and I was yeah. always raised and not 
faulting my parents, but you know, they did the best they could. We have to see it or experience it to believe it. And just even a, a simple example is we cannot see the wireless internet around us, yet it's very, very real. And so we can't see our deceased loved ones with our eyes, but with our mind sight and tapping in how we do, you know, it's, it's very real, you know? And so I, I can't wait. I think I'm going to get your, um, your second book. <laughs> just to start I'll with that. Why don't you give me your address and I'll send oh, it. I, oh, I don't mind purchasing it because I think this is fun. And I really just, we'll just close out the episode now. Um, I'm really excited that you have this passion because it's, it's, talked about a lot of times that you know that science there's no connection between science and spirituality i'm like there's got to be somebody's got to be on to this and to know that you are you and uh whoever you work with as well it's lisa really smart, great. Lisa smart and melvin morris dr melvin morris it's not linda smart by the way it's lisa smart lisa smart okay very yeah, good lisa smart is a linguist and she works she had uh, studied the words of the dying she has a new book called uh, Words at the Threshold coming coming out. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating about how we can learn how to connect with the people who are dying, who are literally starting to progress into that other dimension of nonverbal consciousness. Wow. That's her forte. And Dr. Uh, Melvin Morris has years and years and years of NDE study behind mm -hmm. him with, with uh, Professor Raymond Moody, Life After Life. Yes. All together, the four of us will actually, uh, we are co-creating a conference that will happen uh, next April in Tucson called Coherence Conference. And we'll talk about all this together. Wow. When you have those links ready, please let me know and we can Absolutely. talk again and I can share. And uh, We're in the planning phase, but it should be ready within a couple of months. Yeah. I've talked to Dr. Raymond Moody on this show and he, is, he did mention um, some of this. I thought, oh, awesome that you're all together. Well, Isabel, thank you so much much for Thank being our you. guest it was today pleasure. oh it's great and your website is if you want to share www.survivalofconsciousness.com all in one word mm -hmm. and how about your music website because that's fun <laughs> it's www.zazarmoney z-a-z-a-r-m-o-n-y.com and what a talented musician you are. Really Thank a beautiful voice much. and beautiful. I, and I encourage everybody to check out that music video. And you've got another one on there. And for our listener, thank you for investing your time today to listen. I do think it's been a value because it was to me. Uh, and all, as always, if you visit our website, which is wedontdieradio.com, and if you click on the Insiders Club, I don't spam you with emails or anything, but you can receive a free copy of my book, We Don't Die, uh, as, ver as well as a very healing audio called How to Survive Grief. And also, I do encourage you, if you are interested, um, to come to that conference that's going to be in September, afterlifestudies.org. I mean, there's some really cutting-edge things going on in the world of the afterlife and living life, which is why I think this is all so important, so that you have a great life now, that we all do. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And with all my heart, I believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life will go on after this one, but your life here on Earth is very important. So I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Oh,